Well, welcome to the renovated Alumni Hall. For those of you uh, who this is your first time back, uh, I know you had lunch here yesterday, but from a couple of years ago when we did statewide in here, this room's had a complete makeover, and uh, hopefully you noticed uh, above your head the uh, grand organ, which is really a great addition to the uh, Jacob School of Music here. We're going to kick off Always Learning with a short video that really points a little bit and covers the breadth of what we do and who we are as Indiana University and information technology at Indiana University. I'll be back with you in just a moment. The love of knowledge is a special kind of madness. Our pursuit of it frees us from our limitations, pushes us to understand the unexplained, and drives us to discover the why. Few of us can remember when this love affair began, when we first planted the seed of learning by asking a question, when we first let curiosity take us by the hand but what we do know is that for us, learning never stops. Because life never stops teaching. At IU, we know that the ability to learn is a gift, but the willingness to learn is a choice. From Gary to New Albany and every campus in between, we're learning that cultivating inquiry keeps us on a leading edge. That igniting potential is the key to empowering people. That professors don't just teach. They awaken. And that we flourish when they show us where to look, but not what to see. Learning is the quest to understand the unknown and refine what we thought we already knew. That's why we continue training, gaming, developing, exploring, researching, collaborating, and creating. Because life is about moving forward, about opening new doors, doing new things, and traveling down new paths. The future of one IUIT is colored only by the hues of our imaginations. And through our commitment to always learning, oh, the places we will go. Well, it's my privilege to close out the statewide IT conference this year with a little bit more of a discussion of always learning. As you recall, last year, the conference theme was Aspire. What is it that we aspire to do? How far can we reach? How far can we go? And this year, we've chosen a theme of always learning. As I mentioned in my introductory remarks, we're not talking about learning in the sense of education and formal education and courses and degree programs and things such as that. But we're thinking about always learning in the sense of personal development that each of us in our career, whether we're a first year uh, starting employee, maybe an hourly in the uh, uh, support center, or whether we've been around for quite some time, and maybe we feel like, you know, we've really seen it all before. We're always learning if we're going to be, we must be always learning if we're going to continue to be able to take this institution forward. And one of the things I'm trying to learn is how to advance the slide right now. There we go. So you see, I can learn as well. So when we think of this notion of learning, let's see if we can back up and got it. Yeah, there we go. So when we think of this notion of learning, 
There's a lot of definitions of it. We have a whole school of education over there in a psychology department, a sociology department, that they have long debated what does it actually mean for learning. So if we take a simplified view, I like the notion of, oh, hmm, hot stove, touch, ouch. Okay, I have learned not to do that again. Those psychological experiments show that if you walk someone in and they see a pan sitting on a stove with the burner turned off, and you reach out and have them touch it real quick, and they will jump back even though the pan was frozen, not hot. So this notion and this connection between stimulus and response remains a quite an interesting one. Another view of learning, other than just learning as a behavior change, is learning that is a, that the behavior becomes consistent even though the stimuli are, are different. So for example, we get that grumbly email that somebody has all been out of shape about something, or we get that note that something has happened, or there's a whole range. The real problem that needs to be solved is to remedy the situation. The stimuli may vary a lot, but the response needs to be how do I remedy the situation? Not how do I engage back with someone who's been out of shape? Or how do I fix it? Or how do I show them that I'm in charge of this? But the response is the same. Because even the divergence of stimuli, we recognize we need to solve the problem. In one of the really best books on this topic is uh, by Peter Singa. It's written in 1990. It's called The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization. And one of the great quotes that he has in there is that organizations learn only through, or organizations learn only through individuals who learn. Now, individuals learning does not mean that an organization gets smarter, but it's a prerequisite. I can't say, I need my organization to be smarter. You can't send your organization to school. You only learn through what your people do. And that's the reason I think it is so important for us. We have so many things going well across one IU, IT. But the challenges before us continue to be great. And I personally believe this is an incredibly important time for us to continue to be learning. So in the short talk today, I want to address three, oops, I want to address three ways that we learn. Can I hand you a book? Because I'm tired of carrying it around. There we go. I want to address three ways. So by evidence, by innovating, and by interpreting. So when we think of learning by evidence, there are perhaps some hard facts. You can read them, I can read them, we can see them. I mean, you know, I could keep hoping that really the 3270 green screen is coming back. <laughs> but there may be overwhelming evidence and behavior that folks are going to other devices and that a reprise of the 3270 does not seem likely. So facts matter. And so for us, when facts matter, we have a couple of ways that we systemically ask over a survey, ask 115,000 students across the campuses and 15,000 faculty and staff uh, what they're thinking about the range of services that we have. And we systemically look at, not where did the money go in the budget? This much went to hardware, this much went to software, this much went to uh, staff and personnel, but what did it cost to run an exchange email account? As you all know, our activity-based costing. So I'm gonna invite up to the stage right now, uh, Sue Workman, most of you know, Associate Vice President of cl uh, Client and Support, uh, I have to say support and community engagement, community services, and Jill Piedmont, our uh, chief financial officer, because they, Sue, takes, uh, Sue runs the user survey now, and Jill, as many of you know who've been around here for a while, uh, Jill directed the activity-based costing exercises for some years before she became the finance officer. So I want to ask each of you a little bit about how you learn by evidence, since you see some of the numbers and the outcomes and, and things that this evidentiary exercise produces. And I know you've uh, provided us a little bit of evidence yourself. 
uh, with uh, some of those numbers. So Sue, you want to lead off with this? Actually, it's or, or, Jill. Jill. So we run the activity-based costing, and we gather costs and how money is spent, how people's time is spent, what our services are that we deliver. And we ask all of you, and you all cheerfully fill out your little surveys and happily uh, participate in the exercise. And then it's a step of validation in the data. So the first thing we do is try to say, is the data right? Um, are we reconciling it back to something we know? Um, and then we put out drafts. And then the next step is to say, does this make sense to you? And have that conversation. I think data in a vacuum really doesn't mean so much as data when we incorporate it with what people know about what's going on with it. Is it right? Did we allocate all the costs? But what else do we know that drives these costs? And we look at trends over time. And so I think the survey, the chart we're seeing up there is email consulting for the support center. So that's just total cost to deliver email consulting, total number of contacts, and so we get to a cost per. And what the trend line are up there shows us the five-year trend. Um, and we use this for a lot of things. We use this to say, well, what's more expensive, email or telephone, email or chat? Which are we putting our resources into? Um, when we went out and tried to negotiate with Ivy Tech, we needed some place to start with to say, how much should we be charging them to deliver support center services? They gave us some estimates of how many contacts they thought we'd have. We then knew what we thought the cost per contact was, so we could say, this is how much it's going to cost us. Without this information, we would have been picking a number. Can I interject here? Many universities long to have an ability to understand the cost of a service. And we engaged in an activity with some of the Big Ten universities of, uh, some number of years back because email was all the rage. Okay, you can outsource student email, give it to Google, and thank them for taking it. Uh, but what about administrative email? Or, you, you know, uh, do you want to do that in-house? Do you want to run it in some way? And so we were trying to get to a common way to account for what is the cost of running exchange. And, you know, the whole cost. The phone's going to ring when something doesn't work, an account gets deleted, it has to be restored, and all. One of the things that we learned in that exercise with our colleagues who very much wanted to answer that question is, you cannot honestly account for the singular cost of a singular service. So in the model that we use, all of the personnel expense across all of these services, you and your managers and directors allocate to a service. Say 20% of Bragg goes to doing this and 25% of Bragg goes to, not by hours and check marks, reasonable estimates in doing this. But what it also means is you don't get to say, oh, wow, you know, Brad is 100% in doing this job, and he's 100% in doing that job, and he's 100% in doing another job, or zero, zero, zero. So what we learned with our colleagues at other universities, when they weren't approaching this holistically, it was impossible to get meaningful data out of the exercise. The whole effort just fell over. Maybe next one here. Second one is another way we use data. So this is a graph of. And I'm going to encourage you to hold that up a little closer, so you sound as loud as I do. Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair question. <laughs> so this is total cost to run uh, human resources, and this is fully loaded. So it has all the infrastructure costs of running this service, but it breaks it down. It's not just total human resources. You can see there's certain elements. We can see how much it costs to, to generate e-docs, how much to run EPTO. And this is, you can see where we allocate costs over time, depending on the priorities of the year and the life cycle of each element of the service. So when we decide we want to reallocate to do a new service, we can see where costs can come down and where cost money might come from um, outside of brink of bad, brink it's, fake Brad. Yeah, it's some, one way of interpreting those bars, those of you by the Oregon can't completely see, is the proportion of money go, that goes into that stack. We may say old systems, we want to put them in maintenance mode. And so the proportion of money that we allocate to this thing going into maintenance, we want that to go down. 
But you notice in the latter two bars, there's a couple of caps that appear on the top. Those are investments in new areas of this HRMS function. So that it's not just how much we put into HRMS, but what's the blend of where that activity is going. Okay, one more pie chart, an eye chart, I should say. What I'm trying to show here is some of the reason we collect a lot of data and we spend a lot of time evaluating what service costs. So as we can report out, I really believe in transparency and I think you do too. So this is a graph of how we spend student technology fees in Bloomington. So we can go back to students and say, thank you for the money. This is what we do with it. And this is just one example. But having that data allows us to tell students, to tell the Kokomo campus or the Bloomington campus, these are the services you get. Thank you for the support, and this is what we're doing together. Um, when it comes to added, uh, participating in surveys with other IT organizations, we groan and we grumble, but we have a lot of the data already because we've invested in that. Um, to, it's a powerful tool. Data allows us to tell the whole story. And when Jill and I and, and Lori and, and others go to fee review hearings with the students, we have received just overwhelming thank you each year that we can show them precisely where their money is going. And a lot of times they don't know where their money is going for add-on fees. Okay. So I got the responsibility of running the user survey a couple of years ago after Garland Elmore retired. And I can tell you we learn a lot uh, by that survey response. We do the survey at Bloomington and Indianapolis every year and at the regional campuses every other year. And we work with survey institutes, so it's all um, significantly significant, statistically significant, sorry. And um, I put this, I chose this same example that Jill used. So on the left you see um, the support center email activity-based costing and the chart that she used to look at cost per contact. Another way to look at that data is the support center email and compare that to the quality. So actually this was a great example that Jill chose because it shows the kind of data that we really want to see. So you see the first three years on this chart, um, they'll be on your right, it shows we spend a lot of money, but the satisfaction wasn't as high as we wanted to get. So we continued to spend a lot of money, and then we, the third year we started making prog er, progress and changes to processes and the kind of resources we put in there. And then you see the quality jumped very high for the next two years, but the cost went down. And so that's exactly the kind of example that we like to see. You put a little money in, hopefully you get the, the service and the user satisfaction higher, and then you, the money doesn't have to be so high and you continue to maintain and it. And I can say, the other thing that we see when we start a service, early on, our community may not know how to use it very well, or they may not get referred to using it. But then after it becomes a little more diffused through our community and a little more accustomed to it and we get better at it, you see that spike like it's illustrated there. Right. Next one. So another thing we learn about is usage. And so this was from the 2013 survey, and it really re it, um, surprised me greatly the jump in laptop usage and the percentage owned. But the thing that also really excited me here was the, the tablet ownership. So this was February of last year, and I think we'll see another great big jump this year. But it was much higher, actually. I, I can't see it from here, but I think 34% at IEPY was tablet ownership, and that's a, that's a significant statistic. That means we have to plan for that. The other thing that you can learn from here is um, usage on campus. And you'll see that the campus usage for a laptop is really low which means there's something else we need to learn from this. Does that mean that students really don't want to bring their laptops to campus and use them here? Or are we just enabling them because we have 
computers in all the, the STCs here, and, and so therefore they don't need to bring it. So there's a lot we, have, we can learn just from looking at ownership and usage. Absolutely. The Student Technology Center debate is one raging nationally. Some schools have stopped having STCs at all. Students, you're totally in charge of bringing your own stuff. Um, but then we keep looking at the data regarding our STC usage, and it remains very, very high amongst the students. So trying to reconcile those right. two things. Right. So another thing we look at is satisfied versus highly satisfied. So there's a scale, a five-point scale for satisfaction. The satisfied percentage comes from anyone that chose a three, four, or five, the high scales. We look at highly satisfied, which is just people that chose a four or a five. And then we start to look at what are we doing really, really right here? And what are we doing that's just okay? And then what do we really need to improve on? So these are some of the overall categories that um, we looked at last year. But it does give you a different perception of satisfied versus highly satisfied. And of course, we want that highly satisfied mark. And we would observe a difference in these. Like if I go to Dennis Cromwell's shop and say, how many people are highly satisfied with their data jack versus how many people are satisfied with their data jack? It's hard to discern that there's really going to be a big difference there. But the timekeeping system, lest I mention that, the timekeeping system, there may be more variance between those who say, OK, it's good enough, and those who say, yeah, you know, this really works. It's easy, and this is a good thing. And then lastly, we don't just learn just from the responses. We also learn from comments. And sometimes the comments are a little bit different than the responses. So this past year, uh, there was quite a few comments about wireless. And so we went ahead and before the lifecycle funding was ready, we went ahead and re replaced the wireless. And so we learned from that. So there's that. We learned about link phones and that people think about that as a phone replacement versus a collaboration platform. And just awareness of services. We get a lot of comments saying, I didn't know you offered these services. So that's, those are some of the things that we've learned from, from the survey. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we can learn from evidence. Evidence exists all around us. Some of it generated internally, some of it available elsewhere, and some of it needs to be correlated. The numbers are one thing, but what are we hearing? Do we need to run a survey to know that in high-density areas we were having trouble with the HP wireless system? No, we didn't. We knew that. We, we heard it. It confirmed it here. But some things that we may hear anecdotally, they don't show up in the survey data at all. So we're always pulling together different blends of evidence. We also learn sometimes just by innovating and pushing out there a ways, maybe in times and ways we don't understand everything about where we're going, but by pushing out there, we learn as we go. So one of those opportunities is the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative. Watch this short video with me. For over 25 centuries, the great universities of the world have always had three fundamental missions. The creation of knowledge, that is of research and innovation, the dissemination of knowledge, and that is education and learning, and the preservation of knowledge. This initiative came from several faculty members who approached the Office of the Vice Provost for Research, uh, telling us that some of the tape recordings uh, some of the video and even film on campus were degrading quickly and rapidly and they were worried about it. Uh, I thought maybe we'd have a few tapes and a uh, few films, but they came up with over 600,000 items. This content's unique in that in some cases the actual audiovisual material, the film, has started to corrode, it may not be usable, or the equipment that you would use to view or listen to this content no longer exists. 
there are some really valuable items here and how do we take care of them forever so that the scholars can actually access them. One of the goals of the MDPI project is to make this material accessible and available to a much broader uh, community. Let's think about films right now. In order for a faculty member or a student to use one of the films that we have in the library, for example, they need to come into the library and view it there or perhaps check it out to a classroom. But if this is done correctly and we can work through all the intellectual property rights that material would be available to a much broader audience and in a much more uh, transparent manner. Digitizing them now is uh, very important so that we can preserve them for uh, over a long period of time and make this available for scholars not only at Indiana University but all other universities around the world. How do you do that? How do you take 600,000 time-based media objects, decide which ones are even important and really worth preservation, deal with rights clearance, find the equipment that could read them, uh, where are you going to put it, what's all the metadata around it, and how much would it cost to do that? Well, we've been on a journey by innovating first, even, even figuring out how to take an inventory of that stuff. And then how to figure out, well, what would it cost? And what would we do it ourselves and have, you know, graduate students and hourlies, you know, flipping pages and changing reels and, and doing things? Or would we just go out to the commercial market, just write a big check and ask somebody to do it all? We explored all of those options. And as the president announced with the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, we came to the conclusion that we could best do this by taking the best of the talents within the university, particularly the libraries and some of our faculty who have expertise in this area, and combine it with a for-profit public-private or a for-profit company and form a public-private venture in doing so. Uh, we ran a very long process in figuring out how to do this, and I'm pleased to say that Lori Antolovic, who I saw here, Lori, will stand up, is going to be the founding executive director for the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative. And this has been on quite a roll of, of, uh, of progress of moving forward. The firm that won the contract and we're in the final, final signing the, the details with is a Belgian firm that already has worldwide expertise in doing this. And we're already hearing inquiries come to us from other universities who say, we've got big collections and we know this is capital intensive and expertise intensive. So it really is a business with an economy of scale. So just as we started the Global Knox some many years ago with just a few people and built our way into that and learned and now we have almost 100 people in Dave Gent's area, this has the potential to create a real center of excellence here in Indiana University in media digitization and preservation. A second example, if I may, and I'm going to ask the guys to come up where they're sitting. Here, here, you guys come on up and uh, uh, join me. Yep. Uh, many of you have seen one, one.iu.edu, uh, the new search portal, if we use that term, almost app store. And so we've got a little video of it running here. As you can see, if hopefully you've been there. Have you been to one? Get out your phone. Go, go, now. Okay, you go, you go out to one, and the, the key point is you can type in what you want to do, like where's the bus? You type in the, the thing you want to accomplish, it pulls up here, it goes right to the app, per se. It's showing us where the bus is, buses are. We've got a selector over here, this is the Bloomington bus system. We could uh, turn off and say, I don't care about bus three or bus five, I only want to know where bus one is. Going back to the top again, typing in, uh, well, I want to essentially uh, pay my parking ticket. So rather than navigating seven clicks to get there, you see the parking ticket pay app comes up. Surprisingly, it has a five-star rating. I didn't know you guys were so into paying parking tickets. <laughs> but this exposing of a rating system is really going to be transformative. That means every service owner whether someone in auxiliaries or someone in UITS or in a school, when you publish your service in here to be found, you are opening up that service to receive stars and comments of direct feedback. 
So learning by evidence, remember what we just spoke about a moment ago? This is really going to open that up at a scale that we've never had before. So let me go straight to the uh, interview here with our uh, uh, leads on this. And I'll ask Brian if you will just uh, lead off. I think many of you know Al Alan Walsh, who is heading up a lot of the community relations with this uh, across all of the campuses, Nate Johnson and his team doing the development, and Brian McGuff as a director. Uh, Brian, in a succinct manner, tell me how this idea came to me, and then what you guys have been thinking, how it came to me, and what happened next. Sure. Um, and try to be as loud as I am using the mic. As loud as Brad, OK. okay. Uh, really, we, we'd we been reading the feedback. We got the voice report, the last few voice reports, and, and we found a lot of uh, user dissatisfaction with One Start. So really, the core concept that we focused on here in the evolution of One Start was keep it simple. Um, it's really easy to uh, have things get overcomplicated, and I think that's what happened uh, with one start over the years. So we, we set out with just a few core constructs, open up search, uh, have you know user interfaces that people will already understand how to use, an app store style interface. And, and that was the basis upon which we really started. Keep it simple. And Brian came to me and said, uh, and with Nate, and said, we think we know how to reinvent one start, and it's radically different. We're going to use search. We're going to publish the path and the metadata outside of authentication, let the search engines index all of that. And we want to push authentication as late in a process as possible. A lot of times right now, you have to authenticate very early. Who are you? So that means all the stuff behind that, the search engines can't index. But if we move authentication later and we cut up the pieces, like, again, pay a parking ticket, drop a class, buy John Stewart tickets, where's the bus, you know, all of these things, and publish them as apps in an app store-like interface, we can use the most powerful metaphor people know right now, and that is search. Just type in your outcome. And so search, click, done became our thinking about how to do this. Now, it was easy for Brian to pitch the idea and me to say, gosh, we got to do something. I think we should. Now, Nate, you and your team make it work. How did you go about this? Uh, well, first of all, I have a really great team, so they did some fantastic work for this application. Um, but what we did was we wanted to focus on uh, a responsive design first and foremost. It had to work on your phones, on your tablets, and on your desktops. So if you look at it in the different places, it should look and feel differently and be optimal in those places for you. Um, we also use uh, some more modern frameworks. Um, we use modern uh, uh, model view controller frameworks so, in the So rattle browsers. off the geekishness of it. What's it developed in? Uh, it's, it's developed in uh, Angular JS for a client-side MVC framework. It's a, it's a framework all in JavaScript. It runs all in your browser that's written by Google. Uh, we've also used uh, Twitter Bootstrap 3, which is a rebuilt bootstrap engine um, from the previous version that's built mobile first. And then we use the same uh, proven style that we've used over the years, a, a RESTful style uh, Java web services based backend that we've had a lot of experience really perfecting over the years in other applications. Isn't it great we have people who can speak that? <laughs> yeah, and actually know what it means? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I want to tell you, my confidence in this team, because of experience over time, is remarkably high. So when they came to me and said, we finally, we really, we have a paradigm shift, and Craig Stewart in Research Technologies, he says you have to be licensed to use the word paradigm shift. But this is one of those cases where we really are saying, this is a paradigm shift in how we deal with provisioning and finding services at Indiana University, and they said they could turn it on in the fall, and I said, go, and they will know that I started socializing it with, uh, within the university and beyond uh, faster than they were writing it. Now, Alan, you've been out on the road show to different campuses, different schools, departments, other parts of the university who own and develop service. How's the road show going in, in reaction? It's great, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Brad, uh, and I think it's a wonderful example of what you've been talking about up here uh, so far today, which is this 
learning by gathering evidence, we're really paying very, very close attention as we develop this to uh, the people who are using it. And we're trying to learn about those people, how they use the app, what they like, what they don't like. We mentioned already some of the evidence that we had in our hands when we started, which is the voice report, the annual survey. But we're now baking into the entire process a kind of a feedback mechanism. Uh, we've got a student steering committee that's working with us. They're eating the dog food every single day providing feedback for us, very unfiltered feedback. We have a feedback button or two on the main page there uh, for anyone who's using the app. And believe me, each and every one of us reads that every day. We pay very close attention to what you're telling us. And we incorporate that into the product because this is just the first beta. We're just getting started. This is by no means the finished product. It's going to look very different in six months and certainly a year from now. And that's going to be driven by you while we learn about the people that are using the app. That's how we're incorporating it back into the app and innovating as we go. And having been able to watch it through all the iterations about every 30 days, it already looks vastly different than what it did when you guys even showed it to me in, in the first pitch of it. The first sets of services we're turning on are those that are student focused. I asked Rob and his team, I said, go to one start and give me a list top to bottom the most used things that people navigate through one start to get to to do something from top to bottom then focus on the set of those that uh, students touch and that should be our first priority to get moved into one now one starts going to keep running for you know a year or two for sure i mean we'll, we'll run this in parallel the url is one.iu.edu or we also have numeral one dot iu dot edu will go there as well now i would say you guys and they particularly maybe you and your team know this app better than anyone else i mean this is your baby it's kind of a four month old screaming and sleeping at night a little bit now uh right but i, I do have a question for you if i were to go to one dot iu dot edu and i typed in a question and i said play my theme song so and I don't mean my theme song, I mean one. If one had a theme song, what would it be? And I, and I, I think there may be at least three candidates for it. So I want to see kind of audience reaction with the guys here. You know, would it be really a party? Would it be... kind of one obsessed, or would it be something a bit more passionate? I mean, would it reach into its soul and express that feeling and connection with the love? Possibly, it's really just more timeless. It doesn't want to be a passing fad like One Star. It really wants to be timeless through the decades. Okay, personally, I'm voting for Bono. I don't know what you guys are thinking, but personally, I'm voting for Bono. Great work, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, sometimes when we learn by innovating, we don't know where we're going. We, we see an idea out there, and we know we want to go after it. And the guys pitched this to me, and I said, yeah, we ought to go do this. But little by little, as we came to understand more of what it really meant, what really occurred to me is it's a little bit like this. Now, you probably can't read exactly all of that, but this is a screen grab of a Unix or a Linux prompt. And so if you type in ls, it will basically give you a shortened directory service and a list of all of that. And you may say, what the heck does that have to do with what you just showed us? Think this through just a little bit more. One start at the dawn of the growth of the web was really about how you navigate to and find and get to this explosion of possibility on the web. But if I think back to my old Unix days, 
Unix, I would be logged in and I would have a prompt. And at that prompt, I had the power to invoke just about anything that that system would do. And I didn't need to deal with silly navigational matters or things like that. I could type in some kind of a cryptic command, you know, like a PD, a PWD, you know, print working directory, and pipe it to the printer. So as long as I knew the secret handshake of the geeky speak of Unix, it didn't matter where that program name was, I could get the outcome I wanted. As we started thinking through one just a little bit more, if you think of all the services across the university, you don't really care that you're going to the Oracle PeopleSoft system to look up and find and navigate down to to ultimately get there and drop a class. You didn't care about the journey. You cared about drop a class, that one, done. That's what you cared about. So in a way, one has become essentially the semantic command line to services at the university. But you don't need to know, I say semantic, it's, it's the words that we understand. The thing I want to do is uh, find my timesheet or clock in, clock out. I mean, here's a case in point. The day they turned on one, I was in a meeting in, in Washington and uh, I got an email and they said, it's live. So, okay, great, I gotta try it. So I, I ran and I typed in uh, a couple things that I knew and so then I typed in clock out. It didn't go anywhere. And I thought, well, it should know that. I mean, it, and then I went, because I sent an email note, and they said, well, it's timesheet or timekeeping or something like that. And I said, no, no, no. People may think the verb they want is to clock in or clock out, even if it's old school, clock in. And, and I got a note back, just a minute. <laughs> so all they do is they go and add the metadata, clock in, clock out, to the app called timekeeping. They said, try it now. I type in clock in, boom, straight to it. Learning by innovating. We didn't read that. We innovate. We didn't even understand where all we were going from the beginning. But we are learning by innovating along the way. So in our final method that we'll talk about, learning by evidence, learning by innovating along the way, the other one is by interpreting. I hope many of you were able to be there yesterday morning for the opening panel when we talked about privacy and security in a cyber war world, a conversation about Edward Snowden and the NSA. Uh, I thought it was a really powerful session. Isn't Lee Hamilton great in his just definitive, yeah. Uh, Fred, Raquel, absolutely great uh, stars in their areas as well. But Lee's almost 40 years in the Congress really just came ringing through. So sometimes we have to interpret what's going on around us and figure out what does that mean for Indiana University. Year before last and to some extent last year, there was all sorts of craziness going on that MOOCs were going to replace the university or you've seen various things uh, over time. And we had to interpret that. And as I shared last year, I think the president and the leadership has interpreted that fairly wisely, that it was really kind of an overhyped phenomenon. There's probably some, some there there in online learning. There's cost pressures in, in uh, attending uh, college. But we had to really interpret that. What does it mean for the namesake institution of the state? And what should we be doing when and through what ways? In this particular conversation yesterday morning, one of the reasons I chose it is I wanted to hear a broader conversation for everyone about some of the changing world that we're facing out there around privacy, cyber attacks, and security. Because we've been pretty deep in this conversation for a long time, but it really spilled over into the public dialogue with the hacking of the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg, who all came out in the first quarter of 2013 telling more about that. A lot of things had been known in previous years. But when we look at an enterprise risk management perspective of keeping the university safe as best we can, of mitigating financial risk, reputational risk, while continuing to enable all the things you saw in that video a moment ago about 
the things that we do at Indiana University, we knew the world had changed. And it was time we could no longer leave IT resources as distributed as they were when evidence after evidence after evidence, internal audits as well as things that we were seeing in the news were showing that securing IT resources has become a very professional activity that needs time and attention and skills put on it. And I can tell you as a professor who ran servers with my graduate students occasionally taking care of them, that's not always our first priority. So IT28, we walked that through a large conversation, IT Policy 28, many of you know what it means, that's our shorthand, cyber risk mitigation. What is Indiana University going to do to adapt itself, to interpret the world around us today, still enable the consumerization that we see going on in information technology devices, greater use of cloud services, but dealing with a threat perspective that has at a level, an order of magnitude difference than it was even a couple of years ago. So IT28, we have a busy, busy year for us. All of the schools, all of the administrative units, all of UITS, and I want to repeat the three core tenets of IT28. It says to first order, servers to the greatest extent practicable, things that really are targets of risk, should be in secure facilities. That's the Bloomington Data Center, the Indianapolis Data Center, and in some cases, units have a proper facility that is secure, that is environmentally controlled, that has all the things around it. But let's get into secure facilities. This has had tremendous attention from the trustees, and I have been reporting each year on the progress in doing that. To second order, it says, to the greatest extent practicable, units should make use of common shared services provisioned by UITS. Now, do I believe that somebody can download and install Plone and run a website on it anywhere? Sure, sure you can, or pick something else, Django or whatever, but one of the first efforts to reduce the risk profile to the institution is to reduce the surface area of the number of things that can be compromised. So do we really need 30 instances of Plone or various content management systems, pick the one that is, is your favorite, or if your real goal is you need to serve out web pages, could you use the commonly provisioned web content management system? Now, as others have said, it's got a steeper learning curve, but once you get it, you can move really fast and reuse a lot of things in it. But by using it, we reduce the number of systems that could potentially be compromised, as many universities have found, things that seem like pedestrian infrastructure have proven to be vectors in for uh, attacks. So to the greatest extent practicable, make use of common shared services. And we do have some nuance in the policy if you read it carefully. There is a presumption for administrative uses in the schools, in the departments, across the university, really a heavy bias on the use of shared services. For our academics and our faculty, where there really is some real gray space of thinking about whether that's necessary for the education or the research mission, probably a bit broader latitude in that latter category. But what's going to make it all work? We've moved from a position of hoping that people are paying attention to things that could have reputational seven, uh, I won't say eight because I've not seen an eight, there may be, but at least seven figure damages uh, to the institution. We have to notify the Attorney General on a number of matters anymore. Uh, we've seen a pivot from hoping for the best. With IT28, we are saying, just like financial risk, we are going to account for the risks that we are creating. So if a professor in the School of Informatics and Computing very legitimately needs to run a lab with a bunch of equipment in it for instruction, or uh, uh, somebody needs to run a big server for a research project and all, that can be okay. 
But in that review with the dean, the dean and I will jointly sign off and say that that risk is being mitigated by this person is in charge of it, they have time to do it, they have the training to do it, and it is being monitored on an ongoing basis. So just as I sign off on all the financial transactions, ultimately, as does your department head and unit head, we will be doing this for cyber risk. So we got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. And again, this is a little bit like the previous one on the innovating side. We are learning as we go. We are co-creating the processes the implementation means what we're doing with this uh, as we go along. But it is necessary for us to adapt, to learn and interpret the world around us to where we're at today. So to wrap up, three ways we learn. We learn by evidence and we ignore it at our peril. We learn by innovating as we go along and we learn by interpreting the world around us in refitting Indiana University to us. I close with my famous, or uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from Ari Degas. This is also from the fifth discipline, the art and practice of the learning organization. Uh, Ari Degas writes, the ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. We're in a situation now where students have more choices than ever before where they take intro courses, and then they may want to graduate from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, or they may want to graduate from Bloomington, but they may take more courses somewhere else, online, Ivy Tech, other places, and want to transfer them in. They have a range of choices, and so we are in a competitive space on education, unlike we have been at before, and online substitutes will continue to nip at the heels of that. For federal contracts and grants, the money going into the NIH, the NSF, uh, uh, Department of Energy, et cetera, the forecast and everything you see, it looks like growth there and contraction, uh, very modest growth and contraction in many places. So what that means is many institutions that are research-intensive universities or uh, aspiring to be research active universities, the competition for that is gonna get harder and harder and harder, more people chasing fewer dollars. And that is why our ability to learn faster with our faculty, with administration, with our staff and students, than the rivals around us could be, I believe, is very instrumental to our success in the next chapter of Indiana University. I want to give a special thank you to uh, the communications office, uh, the support organization, and everyone who has pitched in to help with what, in what I have seen and heard, perhaps one of our best statewide IT conferences ever. I think there are over 64 parallel sessions. Uh, great to see everyone last night who was able to attend the staff appreciation event at the uh, CIB. And with that, I will bring to a close the 2013 Statewide IT Conference. And as you go out and think about this year, ask yourself, ask each other, are you always learning? Thank you. <laughs>